Folks, we're turning in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, and it's the fifth chapter, the book of Daniel in the chapter five. And just as you're turning to the place, I would like again just to add to the words of welcome that you've already received. We are glad to see you, and uh, we thank you very much indeed for coming. And it really has surprised me just how many have made the effort to come out and then to come back out again. And then in the second week, you're still here and we're glad to see you. Uh, We've still another week to go, so you're pacing yourself, but we are greatly encouraged by the support of God's people. And for those who have made the sacrifice to be here and others who are not able to come, we know that you're here in spirit and you have been praying for these meetings. And I would like to thank you personally for your prayers for me. And I trust the Lord will encourage my own heart as I preach. Give me the strength and energy that I need, both spiritually and physically. And I trust the Lord will give to me the renewing of that strength uh, through your prayers and by his hand upon me. I've been greatly encouraged through my own daily readings. The Lord has been speaking to my heart. And uh, even portions that I haven't been reading through Murray McShane's calendar readings, but Uh, Just in the life of Jeremiah, I have been so greatly encouraged by this uh, dear saint of God, and uh, he's an inspiration to me, and I just felt some very encouraging words that were spoken to Jeremiah. Uh, The Lord brought them very vividly to my own heart, and such a blessing, and I've experienced the fulfillment of God's promise. Uh, Whenever he said to Jeremiah, I, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, by the way, He says, be not afraid of their faces. (laughs) When you're standing here and you're seeing what I'm seeing, now when you're sitting there and you're only seeing this face, you wouldn't be afraid of this one. But when I'm standing here looking down on what I'm looking at night by night, well, the Lord just encouraged my own heart and said, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. And then the Lord reached forth his hand and touched the mouth of Jeremiah. And the Lord said, See, I have put my words in thy mouth. And so that greatly encouraged my heart to know that the Lord's very mindful of me. And I know you're mindful of me, but I tell you, infinitely greater is the Lord's been thinking on me. And he has given me encouragement, and I trust that he'll give me help tonight to preach the gospel of Christ and of God's free grace as it's offered in the glorious uh, gospel of our Saviour. We're glad to see you. Bring some others with you as well, please. And we encourage you to do that. Let's turn in our Bibles then to Daniel chapter 5. You should have the place found by now. Daniel, the chapter 5. We want to break in at the chapter at verse 17. But just to give you the context, because we would need to read a few portions, go even into the book of Isaiah. We will be looking at a verse in Isaiah later on. But it is the scene that again has captured many an artist impression, and that is the great feast of Belshazzar. In fact, you could put a title over this chapter and any picture you would see, and it's literally called The Night Belshazzar Was Slain. Some tremendous artist impressions. In fact, Rembrandt has a picture of the night Belshazzar was slain, and he has the festivities is all those people around Belshazzar's table, all those women and those drunken men. And then you can see the mysterious hand coming out and beginning with the fingers to write upon the wall. And the scene, I looked at it today. I don't have the picture, by the way. It's worth millions. Uh, I was just looking at it on the internet. A tremendous picture. And then I was able to get it on my phone and got it blown up and looked at the, the very faces of those and the horror as those were looking at the fingers writing on the wall. So he has a great feast made. And then what happens is the fingers come, they write on the wall those words that nobody could discern, meany, meany, tekel, you farson. And then he called for the astrologers and all the men of wisdom and all those that were uh, counseling him for years and even those that were still alive and would have counseled, and I say this, his grandfather, even though it says Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, I reckon that it's a, a term that we will take as his, it was his grandfather. And as a result of that, we see that some who counseled Nebuchadnezzar, there's no doubt that the queen Now, I don't know whether it's Belshazzar's wife or it's the widow of Nebuchadnezzar. We're not sure, but she knew about Daniel. No one could interpret 
the dream, or sorry, the fingers on the wall and the writing. But Daniel could, and he was called to the royal court, Belshazzar, and all the astrologers and magicians and wise men of Babylon, and all those who were gathered that night, and even now the queen herself, were all there, and Daniel comes, and he gives the interpretation of the writing on the wall. We join the chapter then at the verse 17, and that is a brief summary of the context of this Bible reading. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou his son, and I believe it's grandson there, O Belshazzar, Hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified? Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, Thou art weighed in the balances, and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Amen. The night Belshazzar was slain. Let's just keep our Bibles open. We'll ask help of God in the ministry of his word. Let us all pray, please. Father, we thank thee once again for a sense of the divine presence. We thank thee for help given in past evenings. And we have to acknowledge thee before we petition we acknowledge thee, O God, and thy hand that has been upon these gatherings. Thank thee, Lord, for fruit for our labor. We thank thee, O God, for precious souls that have been saved. We thank thee for many who have come in under the sound of thy word. Thank thee, O God, for those that have gathered tonight. And we pray for especially for those who are out of Christ, without a Savior. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst be pleased to enable them uh, to fasten their minds upon the preached word. God, grant that you will captivate hearts tonight. Bless thine own blood-bought people. Encourage them. Remember some, perhaps, who may be cold at heart, backslidden, Lord, in heart or even in life. We pray that they may return again. God, we pray that thou wouldst lift up our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and exalt his high and holy name. We pray that his finished work, the power of his precious blood, would be evidently set forth to this congregation. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst fill me with thy spirit to placard Christ 
and him crucified before this people. Give to me that anointing to preach, that I may rightly divide thy word, that I might know, O God, how to apply it to the conscience of individuals. To this end, Almighty God, I stand once again publicly and before thee, and I address thee as my God and my Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask for the infilling of the Spirit of the living God with wisdom and power. And Father, in answer now to prayer save the lost restore the backslidden revive thy church and father glorify thy dear son and the people of God said Amen in these days of lawlessness and ungodliness let us remember that the government of God has not ceased for the child of God we could get very despondent when we see such wickedness and lawlessness in society but let us never forget that the government of God has not ceased. Society can mock at the holiness and justice and righteousness of our God. Society can take the laws of the Most High and bring them into the court of man and legislate in the court of man and put God's law out of society if they want. They can reject His rule. They can despise His law if they want. But let us remember this. This great truth remains that God has never repealed any single law that he has made. Let us not forget that God's justice may appear for a season to be delayed, but it will always catch up on the godless wretches like Belshazzar. God's justice may appear to be delayed for a little season, but it has not been abolished, even though mankind and society would like to live their lives as if God isn't concerned about the way they're, li they're living. I want to say this to you. You should never forget, God has never repealed any of his laws. His justice, His righteousness, His holiness has not been removed from the earth. He's always the same. And even though it appears that God's justice has been delayed, nevertheless, He will exact justice upon sin. And let us not forget that we must all give an account of ourselves before Almighty God. This very scene and this truth is highlighted for us in the life of Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans or king of Babylon. He was one of those great rulers in the world, full of pomp. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, his realm and his Babylonish kingdom was called the city of gold. It was one of those places where if you would have gone to, you would have been in awe of all the riches and the wealth that Belshazzar had. He had everything, but he was a despot. He was a wicked man. You'll read in the prophecy of Isaiah that he cut people down like trees. Did you know that Belshazzar filled and populated hell with all of his enemies? And even the prisoners that he kept, he never released them. They were never released from captivity. Even those of the children of Israel that were still in the land of Babylon, he would refuse to let them go back to their own land. The whole history of Belshazzar is written up in Scripture. You can read it for yourself. And he cut nations down. And the Bible tells us that he did it in his wrath. He did it just to have a satisfaction in the flesh. It wasn't that they were a threat to him. He ruled with an iron fist. But out of sinful, wicked desire and pleasure, in his wrath and anger, he cut people down. In fact, the image of the fir tree and the image of the cedar as being cut down by the feller, it was likened to Belshazzar. Isaiah, under inspiration, calls him the oppressor. He was a despot. He was a monster. And he ruled with an iron fist. And in his reign, Belshazzar populated hell by tens of thousands of individuals. In fact, the Bible tells me that the chief ones were there and they were put there by Belshazzar. Now you remember that. He'd done them to death in their life and during his reign. And he filled hell with tens, if not hundreds of thousands of individuals. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. And I've said all that for a reason. And you'll find out very shortly. 
He spent his entire life in luxurious living. And he pampered to his fleshly lusts and he wasted his God-given time and opportunities in the pursuit of his own course in life. And guess what? The Lord permitted this man to choose his own path in life without any intervention until the cup of his iniquity was filled. The Lord permitted him to work out his own eternal destiny and steer his own course in life. And while the wheels of divine justice move slowly, they move surely. And eventually God's wrath and justice and holy hatred of sin and rebellion against him caught up with Belshazzar. And whenever he was in drunkenness, and worshipping the gods and idols of wood, stone, and iron, and brass and silver. In the midst of all that, the writing was on the wall for him. And Darius the Mede, and the, some of the Persians were coming in to the city, and without him knowing it, they were already there. And that night, the Bible tells me, was Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, slain. Now, if that's all we have, then we would wonder how his end really came. But that's not all we have. We have the record not only of his sin upon the earth, not only of his wickedness and sin, but we have the very entrance of Belshazzar into the caverns of the damned. And we'll see that in a moment or two. The scene before us bears out that great truth that God will always catch up and sin will always amass against the soul of the sinner. And the cup of iniquity will eventually fill and God will exact his judgment upon the guilty. Belshazzar is celebrating the return or the festival of an old heathen practice and celebration. He calls together a thousand of his lords and he has his wives and his concubines and all those in the royal court and those who courted favor with him. A thousand of his best men, along with many other, were gathered in that banqueting hall for that great celebration of a festival to the pagan god. The festival went on for a considerable amount of time and when they were intoxicated with liquor, they called for the holy vessels that Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, had taken from the Jerusalem and from the temple of the Lord. And he began to fill them with wine. And he lifted them up in defiance of God as if to say, Jehovah, I have your sacred vessels. I now will lift them up and fill them with wine and I will drink to your defeat we have conquered you. We have conquered your land. We rule the earth. And I am a God. That's what Belshazzar was doing. I am a God. He was a celebrity. An individual who felt that he was so widely known. So widely liked. There's no one like Belshazzar in the earth. In fact, the Bible likens him to who? Lucifer, the son of the morning. It likens his pride to that which was in Lucifer when he was first created as one of the most beautiful angels God ever created. And he fell. And his judgment and his doom awaits. And even the book of Isaiah says, Lucifer, son of the morning, you said you will ascend up to heaven and be as a God. That's exactly how Belshazzar was in this banqueting hall. And taking those vessels of silver and those vessels of gold and brass, iron and wood, and stone, they lifted them up in drunkenness and revelry. And they praised the gods and the pagan gods of Babylon. And they defied the God of Israel. And thus they mocked the God of heaven. And they defiled his holy vessels. But that very night, in the midst of their blasphemy, their drunkenness and their revelry, the finger of God sealed the destiny of Belshazzar, Forever. For that very night, there came out of the wall, and you can just imagine it here, from the plaster of the wall, beside the candlestick, so it was well lit up. The fingers came out from the wall, and all of a sudden, the drunkenness was gone. The revelry was over. 
And they looked at the wall and the fingers were there and they began to write, Mene, Mene, Tekel, you farsim. And the Bible tells us of the horror on the face of Belshazzar. He calls for all in his court and in his kingdom to come and give the interpretation. No one could but Daniel and the queen, and I do believe it was the widow of Nebuchadnezzar. The queen came in and says, there's a man in the kingdom in whom the Spirit of the Lord is and he can interpret dreams and he will give us the meaning of the writing. And he said to Belshazzar that night, away with your gifts and all your awards. I want nothing from you. But I will tell you what God has said about you tonight. Belshazzar, you now are finished and your kingdom rule is over. It's gone. You're damned and you're doomed tonight, Belshazzar. You're finished. Hell erupts now in violent fury at the reception of the king of Babylon. Now, I know there's many an artist, and I can't paint, honestly. I could paint matchstick man, that's about it. I just cannot paint. And I admire any person who can, uh, as an artist, paint pictures. But I would love to see a picture. Love to see it. Not of the banqueting hall, but of the reception into the violent fury of hell of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. Because the Bible tells me, now listen to this. As he was eating, drinking, blaspheming God, the Bible says, hell from beneath. Hell was burning under his feet. This man was as near to hell as if he was in it. But here's what it says. It says, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. Now listen to it. Hell is moved to meet you at your coming, Belshazzar. Here's the picture. The word means like a volcanic eruption. It's as if the lava of hell burning with all those chief men and kings and all those people that he had put in there were stirred up. It stirreth up the dead for thee, Belshazzar. And the reception of the king of uh, Babylon, Belshazzar, not into the banqueting hall because he came in great pomp. And he was an individual who thought he was a god. But I'll tell you this, what scripture paints for me is the reception of the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, into the caverns of the dam. And it says this, that they were waiting for him. They were looking for him. And when they heard that Belshazzar was to be slain that night, the Bible says hell from beneath. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Now you think of it. The chief man, the one who was the oppressor, the one who had put many in there, now he was going to be with them. And here's what the inhabitants of hell said. For we have the Bible's record in Isaiah 14. They said, ah, he has become weak as we are, and he has become as one of us. Now what a reception the king of Babylon met. He had many a reception in royal courts. He had many, much pomp and pride. He was going in to meet dignitaries and nations and meet the people. And he came with all of his fine clothing. But then the Bible says of him, and those in hell said, thy body will be given to worms. In other words, they said this, here's the king with all his pomp and all his jewelry and all his gold and all he is now is worm meat. That's what they said of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. And it's all because, and we'll say it in a moment of time, all because, and his sin is summed up in a single statement that we have in the record in Daniel chapter 5. And the sins of a lifetime have now amassed against his soul and his cup of iniquity is filled. And that night, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, was slain. And remember this, he was in the best of health. He wasn't sick. He hadn't cancer. He had no fatal disease. He wasn't wounded on the battlefield. Someone didn't come in and stab this man. No, God took him out. And that night, Belshazzar was slain. 
He was received into the caverns of the dam, and what a reception it was. But I want to say this to you. There's a warning from God for us all. I believe that there's a thunderous voice from heaven tonight. And I want you to think about your own soul tonight. And if you were to die, and hell beneath you was moved to meet you at your coming, and it stirred up the dead to receive your Christless, godless, wretched, sinful soul into eternal burning. I want you to think about that. Because I believe if you thought about that rightly, you would understand why we preach the good news and the glorious gospel of Christ. And I want you to think about your sin that's taking you to that place. I want you to think about the day when God will call you out into eternity and we will gather some of us at your earthly chamber where dust returns to dust and earth to earth. And there will be words filling the air. Of course there will. Many will walk that lonely pathway to the windswept silent graveyard of sorrow where your earthly remains will be laid. But your soul will go out into eternity and it could, we don't know. If you're not saved, then we do know. It will be received like Belshazzar and hell will be moved to meet you at your coming. And it will stir up the dead that's already there to say you've become one of us. Where's all your pride and your love of sin now? Where's all your happiness and your pursuit of sin? Where's all your God-defying behavior? Where's all your alcohol and your drug-taking and your smoking and your gambling and your cursing? Where is it all now? What good did it do? You're just like one of us. That's exactly how they received Belshazzar into the caverns of the damned. That's why you need to prepare now for heaven and escape the judgment of God for sin in hell. In a sense, people say to me, why does God, people, God send people to hell? And I say this to them. They send themselves there. Their sin takes them there. God doesn't send people to hell as if he's a monster. They go there because their sin takes them there. Their sin is punished there. Their sin meets its just penalty there. Unless you and I have come by faith to Christ and realized that our sins have been fully met on the body of God's dear Son, that as the substitute, the sacrifice and the sin bearer, He bore the accursed load, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God, that we might be saved from wrath through Him. You need to prepare to meet God. I want to look at this incident in a little more detail under the heading, very simply, the night Belshazzar was slain. I want you to think, first of all, with only two thoughts, by the way. You know, free Presbyterians, you can only have one thought and last for an hour. But this one's just half an hour and the other one's half an hour, so you're all right. That night, his sin was exposed. Now, you might say to me, well, what sin damned his soul in hell? What did he do that night that warranted the judgment of God and the reception into the violent fury and eruption of hell? Why was hell so moved? Why did it erupt in violent fury? Why did it stir up the dead to meet this man? What great sin did he commit that warranted the judgment of God in an instant? Well, it wasn't drunkenness, although that was evident in the banqueting hall. And it's certainly a sin, I believe, that will bring a soul down into hell. But it wasn't drunkenness, for it wasn't stated in the Bible. That's what happened. No. You might even say, well, what was it then? Was it sacrilege? It had to be sacrilege. He took the holy vessels of the temple of God and he defied God. That has to be the sin. Surely that's the sin. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Although, I'll tell you what, he was guilty of that. And he should be in hell for that. They might even say, well, lasciviousness, for there was evidence 
when his lords and his wives and his concubines. Why does it mention wives and concubines? I don't want to go into detail in a meeting like this, but we know there was lasciviousness. It was there in evidence in the banqueting hall, but Scripture doesn't mention that as the cardinal sin that warranted the judgment of God upon this individual's life. No, the supreme charge that was laid against Belshazzar that night is found in the fifth chapter of Daniel and the verse 23. Look at it with me. Look what it says in verse 23. In Daniel chapter 5, we have a beautiful, I believe, and an accurate record of why Belshazzar entered into the caverns of the damned. Look at the latter part of it. The God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Do you see it? That is the sum and substance of this man's entire sinful life. The God that you didn't recognize, you did not acknowledge, you never worshipped, you had no time for, no place or room in your heart for the God of Israel, the God of all creation, the true and the living God, the God of all creation, Elohim, the God who is the sovereign, Adonai, the God who is almighty, El Shaddai, the God who never changes, a God of love and mercy and justice and truth, Jehovah, the eternal I am, the God in whose hand your breath, your very life, your existence is in. You never acknowledged him. You never believed in him. You had no time, no love, no affection for the true and living God. And in your life, in your life, my friend, that's what he's saying here. Belshazzar, all your ways are governed by God, yet you never acknowledge your ways before him. And then you never live to his glory, yet he created you. And yet he, a God of mercy and love, would have received you and would have brought you into everlasting consolation through the death of his dear son, pictured in the sacrifices of the old economy. And I'm saying to you, that's the supreme charge. The God in whose hand thy breath is and all, all, all your ways, thou hast not glorified. And I'll say this to you, men and women, young people, the same charge at this present time could be laid against you. The God in whose hand your breath is, you reject, you defy. Most Christians, when they think about sin in this world, they marvel at the patience of God. When you hear what's happening in the world, and you listen to the news, and you see what's happening in society, and you see the murders and the violence and the wickedness and evil there is in this world, you stand in awe that God is so patient. You wonder sometimes, when will God end it all? Because he will. But he's long-suffering to usward. And the long-suffering of God lead, should lead men and women to repentance. Not to think that he doesn't care. Or that he's turned a blind eye. Or he's an obscure God. Or he really is just too much to do to worry about this earth and he has just left us to ourselves. No, he hasn't. He's in control of all things. And your very breath tonight is in his hand. He can snuff your life out like that if he only willed it. You could overstep the mark and God could lay the charge against you as he did against Belshazzar, the God in whose hand thy breath is and are all your ways thou hast not glorified. There's no place in your heart for the Lord. It seems that you have no time for Christ. You come to a meeting, you come to a mission, but you have an agenda just because someone asks or you're doing them a favor and that's the end. And afterward, the meeting's over, you're back to your old ways. You're out at the weekend, you're drinking, gambling, smoking, whatever it is. But you have no time for the Lord. You have plenty of time for all other things. 
And in many ways, you're lifting up all other gods and you're worshiping, giving yourself to them. But there's no time for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no room in your heart. We were singing that in the opening praise. Room for pleasure, room for business. But no time for the Lord Jesus Christ. No thought of your soul and God's judgment. No concern about your sin and what it means and it's done to a holy God, not what it's done to you. I talk to many young people, you know, who get into trouble. And when they get into trouble, they tell me how sorry they are. And do you know some of them, what I tell them, do you know what you've got? And they say, what's that? I'll tell you exactly what you've got. You've got McGabry remorse. And that's the prison five mile from my house. They're only sorry because of what it's done to them. They're only sorry because the trouble it has brought to them with no thought of what their sin has done to a holy God. And their sin is an offense to God. And it has to be put right. And you have nothing to offer God. That's why God in love and mercy sent His Son to die for sinners. He might provide a full, free salvation for all who will repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of their soul. And I want you to remember tonight, because I am convinced that you are not ignorant. And remember this, Belshazzar did everything in the light of what happened to his grandfather. And Daniel said to Belshazzar, Belshazzar, you remember Nebuchadnezzar and what God did to him in order that he might glorify God. God brought him into the very grass, eating grass like an oxen. And his body was wet and his hair grew and his nails curled. And this was a king like you. And he ruled and reigned like you. And he was a despot. But then God brought him low. And then he knew that the Lord was God and he repented and he turned to the Lord. And you knew all that. And yet, the God in whose hand your breath is, Belshazzar, and on whom in all your ways thou hast not glorified. That's the supreme charge. And friends, listen to me. If you're not saved tonight, you're not in ignorance. You're not in ignorance about the truth of sin, of judgment, of the need to get right with God. It's not that you are bound by or fettered by lack of knowledge. You know all these things are true. You know that Christ came who is God blessed forevermore, that he lived a sinlessly perfect life. He was God and man, two distinct natures in one unique person, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of God's elect, the Savior of the body, the mediator between God and men, God's appointed Savior for sinners like you and me. You know all that. You know there's a hell. And you may even say some of my friends might be there. I don't know because some of them died perhaps in the very act of sin. Some of my friends have died in the act of drunkenness. Some of my friends have died. They've been shot dead on the streets in Belfast. Some of my friends being drunk have walked across the road and been killed and run over by a car. Some, and I don't like to mention it, After a drunken night, they've choked on their own vomit and they've been found dead in the morning and I could go into some horrific deaths of some of my friends and I don't know where they stood with God, but I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this, it puts the fear of God into me to think that they might be and I don't know a person's last end. Unless they've died without Christ, that's the only time I can say they're in hell. So I don't know, but I think about it and it disturbs me to think that they could be there They could be there. And they were not ignorant. And many people around them have asked me at their funeral, where do you think he is? And some have just come out directly with it. They were not Christians. They know. And then when they're challenged themselves, if it was you, where would you be? And they've said it. I'll be in hell. That's where I'd be. I know it. I know it. That's where I would be. But yet, for all that, You've never acknowledged the Lord. You've never confessed that you're a sinner to God. Sure you haven't. You've never repented of your sin, turned from your sin, separated from your sin. And you have never said sorry to God for your sin. And you have never waved farewell to your partners in sin. And you have never come as a guilty sinner to the Lord, bankrupt, destitute, undone, vile and wretched, and cried to God for mercy. You've never done it. 
So you've never acknowledged him. You haven't glorified him. That's exactly what it means. And our catechism, we teach our children, and the summary of good Christian doctrine is, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is what? To glorify God and enjoy him forevermore. To glorify God. God created mankind for his glory. And yet you haven't acknowledged him. You haven't repented and come to him. And you know, God could lay the charge tonight. And the God whose hand your breath is, look, he could just snuff you out and you would drop into the caverns of the damned. I want you to think secondly and finally. And that night, Belshazzar, his sentence was exacted. I want you to turn over to the book of Isaiah and we'll try to finish off in this chapter, although... There's some references in the Daniel, but we'll, we'll mostly concentrate on the chapter in Isaiah. That's Isaiah chapter 14. Now, I want you to see exactly what happens when a sinner dies. Uh, first of all, in the book of Daniel, you don't have to turn to it, by the way. Daniel gave the interpretation, mini, mini, tekel, Perez, in verse 26, 7 and 8. God has numbered thy days, Belshazzar. He's weighed thee in the balance as thou art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided, and we know that night he was slain. But listen to me. While the Bible records that, you don't find too many artists' suppression of Isaiah 14 and the verse 9. Look what it says there in the verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 14. It says of the king of Babylon, in fact, if you look at verse 4, it says, Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Do you see it? How the oppressor has ceased, the golden city, pure gold. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. And look what it says in verse 6. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, that's Belshazzar. He ruled the nations in anger. He's now persecuted and none can help him nor stop him. And then in verse 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, that is the kings and princes that Belshazzar put to death and pushed them into hell. And I want to say something to you that hell was expecting Belshazzar that night. Hell began to erupt. Hell was stirred. Hell was moved at his coming. It's as if, now listen to it, the fiendish, hellish, devilish claws, talons, hands of lost souls were screaming out of the abyss and out of the flame of hell. And they were saying, is that him now? Is he coming now? Where is he? Is that Belshazzar? Is he dead yet? They were moved. They were stirred. It seems there was some conscious awareness in hell that Belshazzar was coming. Now, he was coming tonight. Where is he? They're asking. When is he coming? Why is he not here yet? What's keeping him? Is that him now? Ah, Belshazzar. We have you. You're just as weak as we are. You're one of us now. And you can just see his soul dragged into the abyss and tormented forever in the flames of hell. Now, could I say something to you? You may not like this. Hell may be moved for you on, under your feet right now. Hell may be asking about your soul. Will you reject the Lord tonight for the last time? Will hell be moved for you? Will it stir up its dead for your soul? Will it expect you tonight? Going out of that meeting tonight through those doors, rejecting the Lord, refusing to repent, saying no to Christ, defying God, not obeying His commandment, to repent and believe, not trusting in Christ, resting in His finished work, sheltering beneath His blood. Tell me, will hell... Be stirred up tonight for your soul. Could it be asking now, right now? Where is she? Why is she not here? Why is God so patient? She hasn't glorified God. Where is she? Where is he? Is that him now? Will he come tonight? Can you see it? Hell burning beneath your feet right now. 
If you could only see it in the spiritual world, hell from beneath. You're standing over the pit of hell. The only thing that's keeping you from falling is the grace and mercy of God. And yet you defy God. And you mock Him. And you reject Him. And you despise the thought of getting saved and acknowledging you're a sinner and glorifying God in His mercy, love, grace, righteousness, and holiness and justice. Hell begins to stir in a gospel meeting like this. Hell has moved to think it could be from Balamina, that woman, that man, that young person, could be tonight that hell receives your soul. But you know, if we finish there, we do you an injustice. But I want to tell you something as I close. Things can be far different for you tonight. I'll tell you why, because... Even though just a word spoken from God would end your life, just a whisper, for that's how it came from Belshazzar. Yet the writing could be on the wall for you, but there's writing in this book for you and not on the wall. And it tells me of a Savior who can save you from sin, from hell, and from eternal death. It tells me that the Lord Jesus Christ has taken the sinner's place. It tells me in writing that our Lord Jesus Christ paid the price for sin. It tells me here, by, written by the finger of God, not on the wall to finish you, but in the book that you might be saved. The finger of God is written, the good news of the gospel. Not that you're finished, but the work is finished. Christ has died. Yea, is risen again. The sacrifice of blood the sacrifice of punishment for sin, not his own, but for all his believing people, has been offered and accepted. And God raised his son from the dead. He's alive forevermore. And he stands tonight. He's here. Did you know that? And if the Lord appeared, you would go home and say, you know the Lord appeared in Balamina tonight. You would be totally wrong. Totally wrong. The only thing he would do was make himself visible. He's already here. And his arms are open wide. He's a saviour who loves sinners. He's provided a way of escape for sinners. And you're a sinner. And if you'll come to him, his arms are open. You don't come to the free church. You come to Christ. If you'll just come, his arms are open. Him that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. He'll take you in. Come, what a welcome. There's room at the cross for you. And tonight Christ has died. Christ has suffered, shed his blood, paid the price, offered to God one full, complete, entire, sufficient sacrifice to put away sin, give you peace with God, and to save your soul from sin, death, and eternal hell. And you need to come tonight. And he's here. He's right where you are. He's come to where you are. He hasn't come to the banqueting hall in judgment. He has come to this hall in love and mercy to your soul. And things can be different. But you must come tonight. You must repent of your sin, friend. You must glorify God in taking the sinner's place. And glorify and honor God in the sacrifice he has given through his son for sinners. And you must glorify God by receiving Christ as your Savior. Not your mother's Savior or your father's Savior. Not your brother or your sister or your best friends. And it's good they're saved. But what about you? Where do you stand with the Lord tonight? Is it well with your soul? Are you ready for the great eternity? Let me tell you something. Do you know there's a greater reception? It's the sinner who dies in Christ and enters into heaven. And heaven is moved. And heaven is stirred for the reception of a sinner who dies with her faith and trust in Christ. Now what will it be? A reception in hell or a welcome in heaven? Well, don't be a fool tonight. You know it's logical. You know it makes sense. And I pray God will write his word in your heart and make you sinner tonight willing to leave your sin and to receive Christ and be sure of heaven when you die. And don't let hell burn beneath your feet. Or its wicked dead be stirred up to meet you at your coming. Don't let it happen, friend. But come to a loving, willing Savior. 
He cares and loves sinners. Just come and you'll find there's a welcome there for you. For this man receiveth sinners. Come, come, come tonight. And may God, by his spirit and grace, bring your soul tonight to Christ for his own name's sake. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we do thank Thee for Thy presence. We recognize, O oh God, we have come to an end of ourselves. And Lord, even no matter what we do, we can't create an anxious thought. We couldn't move a single soul closer to hell. But Lord, we believe the gospel can. We believe the Spirit of God will. And we pray, O oh God, that You will draw precious souls to Christ tonight. Give deciding grace, Lord. Give help. Lord, they have no help of themselves. They recognize they're dead, they need life. They're blind, they need sight. They're deaf, they need to hear. They recognize they're leprous, they need cleansed. Lord, it's only thy spirit through the word and the healing balm of Gilead and the physician can heal the sin-sick soul. We pray, Lord, you will pluck brands from the burning tonight. Lift them out, O God, from the very flames of hell that are licking round their feet. Deliver them from the pit. Think of how Belshazzar went down into the sides of the pit. O oh God of mercy. And come on a rescue mission to Balamina. And deliver souls tonight. And Lord we want thee to be glorified. Not only in the coming of sinners to thee. But in our own lives as well. So let us leave this house tonight. Those of us who are saved. Prayerfully and very carefully. Pondering the things we have heard. Give us a passion and a love. And Lord, help to reach souls quicker than the devils reaching them and damning their soul in hell. Help us, Lord, to spread the gospel, to share Christ with our fellow man. Give us opportunities, Lord, beyond the meetings to witness for Christ and to see souls saved. So, Lord, hear our prayer tonight. And in answer to our prayer, we believe, save the lost. Glorify thy name. And the people of God said,